and welcome to Liberty Media Live. We're here tonight with the one, the only David Friedman. Uh, most of us know him as the wonderful author of one of my favorite books, uh, The Machinery of Freedom, or as the author of other wonderful books like Hidden Order. And it, but here tonight, he's going to be talking about his two novels, Harald and Salamander. And I'm really excited because I, I always love to see uh, my intellectual heroes delve into fiction a little bit. So I, I just finished her all today and it was wonderful. Really excited about hearing what David has to say about it. And I know you are too. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm assuming that probably most people here have not read my novels. Uh, neither of them was exactly a bestseller. Uh, so I'm going to talk about them for a while. Uh, and then eventually take questions and comments both from those who have read them and those who haven't. And I guess the first question that people tend to ask me, libertarians tend to ask me, uh, is, is in what sense they're libertarian. Uh, I don't, there's a sense in which they're not. Uh, I'm not a fan of the idea of using a novel to persuade people of your political views. Uh, Rand obviously did it with great success. Uh, but it feels to me too much like cheating because the novelist is controlling the world, the novelist is controlling the characters, so you can make things come out your way whether or not they really would have. And if I think about the works of fiction that have actually affected me significantly, they have not been propaganda, they've been ideas. So the two examples that occur to me are The Moon is a Harsh Mistress uh, by Heinlein, where it's not entirely clear what the political conclusion is supposed to be. The system that he starts with is an anarcho-capitalist society that seems to work pretty well, but it's basically collapsed after getting its independence at the end. Uh, but it affected me because it persuaded me that it was at least logically possible to have a functioning society in which the legal rules were not imposed by an authority such as a government, but were somehow internally generated in and that's one of the things that went into machinery. Uh, and another example would be Werner Vinge's uh, short story, True Names, uh, which is what pointed out to me the potential implications of online anonymity, which I think he may have been the first person uh, to talk about. So I think both of my books reflect my thinking, uh, both politically and as an economist, but not in the forms of what I would think of as propaganda. And I wanted to run through some examples of that. And I want to start out with Harold. Uh, the first long chunk of Harold is about a conflict between my protagonist and the young uh, king of the kingdom of Carlia, James. Uh, my protagonist is a prominent figure in the Vales, which is a semi-stateless society very loosely modeled on Saga period Iceland. Uh, the Vales are not on an island. They're valleys on the far side of a high mountain range. And they were settled from Kerlia on the other side of the range several hundred years earlier. And for quite a while, the kings of Kerlia tried to claim that the people in the Vales were their subjects with very little success. And eventually you have a king, the, the father of James, who instead tries to make friends with them so that he abandons the claim to rule them. And when there's a famine in the Vales, he sends them food. Uh, and the result is that the view of the people in the Vales is a, a gift for a gift. And so they then support him in his war against and defense against the empire, which is a very large polity north of them trying to expand south. Uh, the king dies. His son has not been properly trained for various reasons. And the son has a worldview in terms of tables of organization that the son's view is that people who are in allegiance to him can be trusted and people who are not in allegiance to him cannot. His father has defended the kingdom against a very powerful enemy for something like 20, maybe 30 years by now. And he's done it by an alliance, an alliance with the Vales uh, led by Harold and an alliance with the order, which is a female military order uh, led at this point by Lady Leonora. Uh, James' view is that, he, is that that's not a safe situation, that he can't trust people who don't owe him allegiance, that he can't defend his kingdom without the veils in the order, and that therefore he has to somehow convert his father's allies into subjects. And he attempts a very clumsy sort of coup d'etat against the order. 
and tries to persuade Harold to let James make Harold the ruler of the Vales, which doesn't have any rulers, uh, more or less in exchange for Harold supporting him. That's the background of the first long, long chunk of it. And one of the contrasts is between the view, the way those two different men look at the world. James, as I say, has a hierarchical view. He sees it in terms of, of, of basically allegiance. Harold has nobody at all in allegiance to him. Uh, he has a position in the Vales, which plays an important role in the legal system, but that gives no authority. Uh, if he wants to raise an army, a point I'll discuss later, he's got to get volunteers. Uh, he doesn't have uh, liege men, as it were. On the other hand, Harold has a whole lot of friends. Uh, Harold is, among other things, an extremely good general. And because the king's father was an extremely intelligent and reasonable person, he realized that his ally was a better general than he was. And so for the last 20 years or so, Harold was the commander of the Allied army when the enemy invaded and they needed a commander. So the result is that a lot of the people in the kingdom of Carolia are people who have worked with him, know him, trust him. So you have a conflict between, as it were, these two views of, world and, of the world uh, and these two people uh, one of them with a whole lot of people who owe him allegiance, and another with a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of friends. Uh, and what ends up happening, uh, Harold, of course, wins, as you could guess, since he's the protagonist. But winning does not ultimately mean destroying James. For one thing, Harold knows that when it's all over, they'll have to fight the empire, and that therefore everybody he get, who gets killed on either side of the sort of undeclared civil war they're fighting is one fewer person in the future. Uh, so he, what he does is successfully capture uh, James and then convert him to then try to put him through a set of experiences which hopefully make James into the king he ought to be. And one of the things I did that I suspect is not obvious uh, is that the second chunk of the book is called Payment of Debts. In the first chunk, James has treated Harold very badly. So I expect the readers to think that that's going to mean Harold getting his revenge. But what it actually means is that Harold feels in debt to James' father, who's no longer alive. And he's going to try to pay his debt by giving James the education that his father, for various reasons, did, didn't get a chance to, to give him. So that's part of, uh, of what that, that part of the book uh, is, is really about. In general, I really don't have villains. Uh, not in any very strong sense. Uh, another point, way in which the book reflects my ideas has to do with the strengths and weaknesses of different societies. You have three different societies you're seeing. Uh, the Vales, the Kingdom, which is very loosely modeled on about early Norman England, uh, and the Empire, which is loosely modeled on the Roman, Byzantine, and Abbasid empires in various respects. And each of them has strengths and weaknesses. So that uh, Harold's fundamental problem is that he doesn't have an army. He doesn't have tax revenue to pay people with. He doesn't have men in fealty to him. And yet he needs to raise an army. And his, part of his solution is a style of warfare in which people on his side almost never get killed. That a lot of what I'm doing in Harold is what I think of as logistic warfare. In fact, one of the people the book is dedicated to is the author of a wonderful book on Alexander the Great and the logistics of the Macedonian army, which I could talk about on another occasion. So Harold is trying to fight a war of maneuver, which puts the enemy army in a position where if it doesn't surrender, it will have to die of either hunger or thirst. You see him successfully do that once towards the end of the book, uh, I guess twice towards the end of the book, now that I think of it, and there are mentions of it earlier. Uh, and the reason he has to do that is that if he gets very many people killed, no one's going to come next time. Uh, a second part of that is making war at a profit. Uh, the model I was actually thinking about was the case of the Norse armies that ravaged Saxon England uh, up to about the time of Alfred the Great. Because as far as I can tell, those were not national armies. They were entrepreneurial projects that basically somebody who had a good reputation as a leader said, hey, come join me. We're going to invade England. We're going to get loot. We might get some land. Uh, let's go. Uh, Harold can't offer land because he's fighting a defensive war, though he has the advantage that people have some patriotic desire to, to, to support him because they don't want to get conquered. On the other hand, he may be able to offer loot because 
the Imperials have lots of good stuff. And if you defeat them and they surrender, you can get it. And one of the places where I make that point is a bit uh, after James has been captured by Harold and is sort of being treated by Harold as if he was a junior member of his staff. And uh, the question comes up of tents, that Harold has very mobile troops. His troops are cataphracts, horse archers. Uh, the Carolia uses the equivalent of knights, and they've got wagons and tents and stuff like that. And in discussing this, uh, Harold says to James, you think your tents are a pain. You should have seen his Imperial Majesty's tent. The obvious question is, well, how did you get a look at Imperial Majesty's tent? And Harold says, well, the emperor wasn't using it at the time. And it becomes clear in the passage that what's happened was, at some point in the past, uh, Harold defeats an Imperial army. Uh, what's left of the army leaves, and they leave the emperor's tent behind. And... Harold explains that he got some of his troops to lug the tent back up over the pass, and he set it up in the back pasture. And, you know, someone says, just what every pastor needs. And he, Harold's answer is, don't laugh. Silk hangings, tent poles banded with gold. By the time the story spread a bit, every highborn in the Imperial Army had gold tent poles and chests full of silver and jewels. Made it easy to raise troops the next time. So that's an example of the economics of warfare, of how you uh, manage an, an army without, without a revenue source. And there's another bit uh, later in the in this story that I'm also sort of fond of. And that's, there's a part of the, of the conflict where Harold uh, defeats a imperial army that's invading the Vales. It's on their side of the, of the mountains, uh, led by the best imperial general, who I'll come back to in a little bit, and forces it to surrender. And the army has a bunch of cavalry. And so Harold auctions off the horses to the local plains nomads. At a later point in the book, Harold defeats a imperial army led by the emperor. Actually, it's before he defeats that. He defeats an, a cavalry force that's part of the army with, led by the emperor. And he again gets a bunch of horses. And he manages to take those horses uh, not really he, his allies get those horses back over a pass, back to Harold's side of the, of the mountain range, but farther north than the Vales, at which point uh, they offer to sell the horses to the emperor's son, whose army it was who got defeated in the previous round. Uh, it's made clear that there is some internal conflict within the empire over who's going to be the heir, so that the emperor's sons have their own resources. And uh, Harold, actually one of Harold's sons, who's with the, with the force that's got the captured horses, uh, encounters the emperor's grandson, who we already know is because of some other things that have happened. They're sort of friends, uh, and tells him he's got some horses to, to sell. And he understands that uh, the emperor's grandson's father, the emperor's son, might be in need of horses. And of course, the reason is that Harold captured the horses of his cavalry and sold them off. And, uh, so it occurs to the emperor's grandson uh, that raising and supplying an army off the resources of a mountain farm presented difficulties to which Harold, being Harold, found his own unique answers. This one had a certain wild logic. So all of those are cases where the, cons the economic constraint that Harold faces, in a sense, drives part of what's happening in the plot. Let's look at the other side. Uh, the empire has the obvious advantage that it's got a professional army paid by tax money, the legions, and it's made clear that the legions are the best heavy infantry in the world, that Harold can't defeat them by simply a face-to-face -face charge kind of battle, that the king who's now dead at the very beginning of, the, of this conflict, uh, back long before my book starts, attempted to imp uh, attack an imperial army and got smashed as a result. Harold tells the story of one. Uh, so Harold's got to do it by maneuver, taking advantage of the fact that his troops are much more mobile since they're, they're cavalry. Uh, so the empire has got a good army. The empire also has records. It becomes clear at a couple of points that the imperial generals have studied the, the records of Harold's previous battles. And pr Harold probably has a good memory, but in general, people on his side don't have the kind of civilization that keeps detailed written records of a battle 15 years earlier. Uh, so in that sense, the empire has some real advantages. But the empire also has some disadvantages and some limitations. 
And one of the points that I never make explicitly, but hopefully that some readers pick up on, is the contrast between Harald and Artos, who is the top imperial general. So everybody on the empire's side pretty much recognizes that. He's loyal to the second prince, uh, uh, not directly to the emperor. Uh, there's a point where Harald is confronting an imperial army, and he's just found out who the commander of the army is, and it's not Artos, and he expresses his relief. His comment to the person who tells him is, I may, I may get you back home alive then. Artos is as competent as Harald. That's pretty clear. But he is less original than Harald. But Harald, for 20 years or so, has been defeating superior forces by coming up with a sequence of clever ideas of solutions to each problem. The reason in some sense that Artos is not as original as Harald is that an imperial officer with Harald's approach to the world would never have risen to commander rank and might well have gotten hanged because he would have done the right thing instead of the thing that the book said to do, so to speak. So that's a limitation of the, of the empire. The only place in the empire where you can really fit people like Harald is at the very top in the conflict among the different people who wanted the emperor. But also, the empire, in an odd way, faces the same kind of problem Harald does, although in raising an army, though not the same. Because one of the things that ought to occur to some readers is why it is that when the emperor, that when Harald captures an imperial army, the emperor is willing to ran ransom the troops back. Right? The emperor is not a stupid guy. He realizes that any money he pays Harald to ransom the troops back Harald was going to use either to reward the troops for this campaign or to pay for the next campaign. So why doesn't the emperor, who after all has tax revenue, you can raise more legions if he has to, why doesn't he say, keep the prisoners, kill them, enslave them, do what you like, I'm not giving you any money. And the answer is that in order for the emperor to stay emperor, uh, he depends on the support of the legions. If the legionaries back home know that he left their comrades to die, to be murdered or to be enslaved by the barbarians as they see it, because they wouldn't pay a little gold, they are not going to support him. So in that sense, he faces a similar kind of, kind of constraint, even though, it's, even though it's not the same constraint. And there's also the problem of getting troops to come. There's a point which I sort of make in passing. And that is that in addition to the legions, there are also the auxilia, the auxiliary forces, which are recruited from people, possibly some of them inside the empire, some of them not, uh, but they're not sort of the regular army. They're in effect mercenaries. And the legionaries tend not to take them very seriously. The view of a legionary commander is, as long as I get my legions back alive, I haven't really been beaten. But you then observe towards the, the end of, of the book that there's a shortage of auxilia. Uh, that there is a point where one of the legionary officers is complaining that we need more of that particular kind of auxiliary troops that, and we don't have them. And the reason pretty clearly is that after getting a lot of auxilia killed in the earlier campaigns, it's getting very hard to recruit. It's not they've all been killed off, it's that just like the people Harold wants to fight for him, they're reluctant to fight if they expect to get killed in the process. Uh, so in that sense, as I say, I'm really playing with the economics of warfare from, from, from both sides, and that's part of the, part of the fun. Uh, I should say one of, the, uh, one of James's constraints, the first one constraint is that he's wrong in thinking he can trust anybody in allegiance to him. I make it fairly clear that the most powerful of the provincial lords is really Harold's ally. He'll never say no to the king. He just won't do things that the king wants him to if he doesn't think they should be done. Uh, as Harold puts it, talking to somebody else, Stephen is a fine one for failing when he wants to. Uh, so in any case, uh, the, one of the king's restrictions, one of them is that he depends on his provincial lords being willing to bring their troops to, to fight for him. And if he does a bad enough job, they'll bring the troops and overthrow him instead. Uh, and the other thing is that his people only owe him a month's service a year. So if he uses them early, they're not going to be available unlike the legionaries who are full-time professionals. That's enough about Harold. I want to talk a little bit about Salamander. It's my second novel. Uh, I started a sequel to Harold. I may someday go back to it. But I discussed with Werner Vinja, who is a friend of mine, both that book and my ideas for another book. And Werner persuaded me the other one was more interesting. So I wrote it. And that's Salamander. I think he's right. And I think I did a better job with Salamander, having had, had more practice. Uh, and Salamander 
really started out as a fantasy version of the central planning fallacy. Right? Harold is not really a fantasy. Uh, Bain, Bain treated it as a fantasy, but there's no magic in Harold. Uh, it's just what I think of as a historical novel with made-up history and geography. Uh, Salamander is a real fantasy. There is magic. And the background of, of Salamander is that it's set about 40 years after the magical equivalent of Newton. That for a, many hundreds of years, well, for probably maybe two or three hundred years, magic has existed as a craft. And about 40 years ago, a very bright mage uh, took the first big steps towards turning it into a science. And the society changes slowly. Most people haven't really caught up with that. But the salamander is set largely at the one college of magic in the kingdom. And at least some of the people there, including my male protagonist, Qualus, uh, are sort of at the cutting edge and understand and are working on the, 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 new, the new science of Majuri in the world of Salamander is very weak. A fire maj is more like a match than a blowtorch. And a lot of the training of majs is in how to create large effects with small causes, which is also, of course, useful to non majs This is a very frustrating situation. And Qualus, who is a brilliant theorist, a little naive, as one eventually discovers, but, but very smart, uh, Qualus has come up with a spell, an idea for a spell, that will let one maj pull in the power of many, many other majs and of non majs because everybody has a little bit of magic, even if they don't use it in a very organized fashion, funnel it through himself, and thus finally have the power to do the sorts of things majs have long imagined doing and could never do. And he is thinking of this as an entirely good idea. Right? And this is the magic equivalent of the central planning fallacy. What's the central planning fallacy? It is the very convincing idea that if only some sensible person had control of all of those resources that are out there in the world, wonderful things could be done. And there are three things wrong with the central planning fallacy. One of them is forgetting that all of those things are already being used by their owners for their own purposes. So you would have to stop them doing all the things that they were doing. Uh, a second problem uh, is the assumption that the person controlling all of these things will actually be a good guy, that he will be controlling them for the general good instead of for his own glory and wealth and so forth. And the third is assuming that it's easy to figure out what should be done. I never get into the third, uh, but in Salamander, the first one, the fact that those resources are still being used, shows up very, fairly early. Because my female protagonist, Ellen, is a new student at the college who is unusual in two respects. First, she is an extremely powerful maj, a fact which she deliberately conceals. Uh, but uh, Qualus has at some point figures it out. But second, she's got the same kind of mind as Qualus, that essentially, though I never put it that way, both of them are mathematical geniuses. Uh, the theory of magic that I sketch a little bit uh, its mathematics are based on the mathematics of quantum mechanics as it happened. I won't go into that at the moment unless people are curious. Uh, but understanding it really requires being a very good mathematician. And Ellen is in that category. And is Oh, and the other thing that's unusual is she's already quite well trained, uh, which new students aren't supposed to be. So she's not only a powerful maj, she's quite an able maj. And as eventually becomes clear, the real reason she's there is Qualus, that she wants to learn theory. He is the best practicing theorist she can learn from. And so she's gone to the college in effect as a freshman, even though she really shouldn't be a freshman. And one of the things happening in the course of the book is her helping the other students by in effect conducting her own informal seminars, answering their questions and so forth. But in any case, Quaylus pretty early on realizes that he's finally found somebody in his own class, somebody who can learn what he can teach. And so he tries to recruit her into his project project for developing the cascade, this spell that will pull everybody in. And she refuses. Uh, and I'll quote a little bit from it to, to, to show you how it works. He looked at the girl in astonishment, felt for words to explain. You don't understand. There is so much to be done, so little power to do it with. A river floods. With enough majorie in the hands of a water maj with proper skills, we could divert the water to where it would be harmless. A plague kills hundreds. 
Mothers and fathers, his voice faltered, leaving behind orphaned children. Enough power in the hands of a healer could see the plague when it first struck, cure everyone before the sickness, sickness, sickness spread farther. So much to do and we are so weak. You are young, sheltered. If you had seen, I cannot make you aid me, but consider the needless deaths and misery that might happen if you do not. She shook her head. My mother is a healer. I have seen sickness enough. Men with gaping wounds that she has closed. When you have seized her power to shift a flood, on whose hands will be the blood of those she cannot heal? So that's making, in a fairly dramatic way, the point that all this resource is already being used. And one gradually discovers, as the story goes on, that the one of Quailus's colleagues who is supporting him in this project has his own ideas of what to do with it, uh, which then becomes part of, part of, the, uh, uh, of the story. Uh, so, a couple of other things that are happening uh, in, in, in Salamander. Uh, one of them is watching how a legal and political system is changing. That what I'm modeling that world on very, very loosely is 18th century England, and very loosely. But it's a society which is no longer feudal except for some areas. Think of the equivalent of the clans in Scotland, uh, only in this case it's the North Province. Uh, it's one where the monarchy is becoming more important. There isn't, as far as you can tell, a real parliament, but there are powerful lords as well as the, as well as the king. And one of the things that's changing is the legal system, that it's made clear that the majas have their own legal system, what they refer to as the bounds of majuri, and their own mechanisms for enforcing it. There is, however, a royal official who happens to be the king's brother, uh, who is the royal official in charge of majuri and who has mechanisms for enforcing the laws with regard to Majri. And at the point when one of his people has violated the bounds and been caught in effect, he makes it fairly clear that he's not willing to simply say, all right, well, he's one of my people, so I'm gonna ignore it. Because if he did, that would make it harder for the royal mechanism for enforcing the rules to gradually absorb the informal uh, Maj's mechanism, that uh, he knows that there are prominent Maj's who uh, know this guy is guilty uh, and who will be very unhappy uh, if, if uh, he tries to let him out, and they, in fact, simply enforce the rules themselves. Uh, so there, I'm watching how a system moves from a decentralized to a more centralized form just a little bit partway through that process, and that was fun. And final point from Salamander, is that one theme I had not thought of, but that turned up as the story went on, is the question of in what sense the end justifies the means. That a lot of us like to say it doesn't, but nobody really believes that. That if enough is at stake, you're willing to do things you would normally see as wrong. And Prince Kiran, who is the king's brother, who's the official in charge of Majri and himself a Maj, is the person who in a sense demonstrates. He is not a villain. He's an antagonist in part of the book, but he is in fact an intelligent and generally, you know, honest, uh, well-intentioned person. He finds out that the, that the cascade is being developed. He realizes, as Coelus did not, what a dangerous spell it is, that somebody who had it could in effect take over because he would get all of the kingdom's majory funneling through him. And so Kieran's, Kieran's conclusion is first, we've got to keep this secret. If we could keep it from ever having been developed, that would probably be a good thing, but we can't. There is a risk that other people will discover what Quailus has done so far and complete his project. And therefore, we have to complete the project secretly and under royal authority so that if somebody else has the cascade, we'll have it to use against them. At this point, however, Quailus has changed sides. Quailus has been persuaded that Ellen is right, persuaded partly by Kiran who pointed out how dangerous a spell it was. So Quailus is not willing to finish developing the, the, the Cascade, nor is Ellen. And so Kiron essentially tricks them into his power and threatens Ellen in order to force Quailus to cooperate. And the critical point here is, that, again, is that Kiron is not a villain. That he has, in fact, in a certain sense, warned Ellen about this. That there's an earlier exchange where Kiron, in effect, says to Ellen, 
normally I will try to obey the normal rules of how you ought to behave. But if enough is at stake, I won't. Uh, and, you know, I just have to tell you that. Uh, and Ellen, you know, sort of recognizes that fact. Uh, so he's, he's not dishonest, but he is dishonest in the sense that he, he tricks them uh, into his power in a way I'm not going to go into the details of it. And they then get out in ways I also won't go into the details of it. But the real point there is that Kieran's mistake, I think, is not a mistake in moral philosophy. That if he is right that the fate of the kingdom is at stake, as it were, uh, then it would be excusable for him to behave in the very bad way he behaves. His real mistake is rather a mistake of arrogance, that it's true Chiron understands the politics associated with the Cascade better than Quailus. But Quailus and Ellen understand the science of the Cascade much better than he does, that Quailus invented the thing. And Chiron is taking it for granted that if they disagree with me about what should be done, I'm right. And it's not at all clear that he is. Uh, and that, it seems to me, from my standpoint, is a mistake. And one of the reasons why it's dangerous to believe that the end justifies the means is that we're all biased judges in our own case. We all tend to overestimate our own correctness. Right? So I think that's as much as I wanted to say about those particular books. But I wanted to mention uh, briefly two interesting things that I discovered in writing the books. They're true, I think, of both of them. And one of them is that no plot survives contact with the characters. That in Harold, there was a character, Anne, who, when I originally plotted the book, was the king's mistress, who Harold was using to funnel ideas on his side into the social circle around the king. By the time the novel was finished, Anne is the noblewoman the king is courting. She is, has got the same kind of cleverness Harold does. She has become a major figure. I like to describe her as my stealth heroine because it wasn't planned. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons that James is captured and eventually changes, gets persuaded he was wrong, is that Anne has made it clear to him that she thinks he's behaving like a heel and is not going to marry him as a result. So that, again, I never make that explicit. I mean, one of the things, it's hard to know when you're writing a novel if you're being too subtle or not subtle enough. But uh, what the, the only point in which we see that is that at the point when they come back together after James has agreed to basically side with Harold. Uh, and James says, uh, I am now at peace with Harold and the lady commander at peace and in their debt. And Anne's response is, in that case, if your question is not changed, my answer has, meaning she's now willing to marry him. Uh, so it's, it's hinted at, but it's not made really explicit. Uh, and similarly, uh, things happened in, in, in Harold. I don't think, I think, sorry, that is Harold. Uh, Salamander, I had a plot in which Quailus was going to be the antagonist, uh, in which another character was going to be the protagonist. Ellen didn't even exist except as someone I thought I might bring in as the daughter of the protagonist. Uh, it turned out that she took over the plot. Uh, her father is still a major character, but is a major secondary character. But the central thing was that Quailus is a good guy, He's smart, even if naive. And once he had his nose rubbed in the fact that inventing the cascade was a mistake, he recognized it was a mistake, so he changed sides. So rather than having a conflict between him and another Maj over the cascade, it ends up as him and Alan on the same side, along with that other Maj, against Kieran, and then later against a, another more, somewhat more villainous character. The other thing that I thought was interesting was that world building feels more like discovery than like invention that you make a part of a world and that sort of implies other things that haven't occurred to you. And my standard example for that is from Harold, because there's a point at Harold where it would be very convenient if the emperor's grandson, who is a hostage at Harold's house, could learn the local language. And he only has a month or so to do it in, and you can't really learn a language in a month. And it occurred to me that the solution to that was that he grew up in the Western provinces, the most recently conquered part of the empire, that the Western provinces are part of the same cultural area as Carolia and the Vales, that their language is closely related to the language in Carolia and the Vales. Hence, although the uh, emperor's grandson's first language is the equivalent of Latin, the imperial language, 
he grew up with the servants and his nurses and the people around him, the ordinary people speaking the local language. So he's reasonably familiar with that. So it's fairly easy to learn a language that's closely related to that. Once I had done that, it occurred to me that I had just solved two other problems I hadn't known were there. One of them is why the empire keeps banging its head against the wall. The emperor has been trying to invade Karelia for 20 years or so. He gets defeated every time. Why doesn't he give up and go invade somewhere else? And the answer is that Karelia is the last undefeated part of the area that the emperor's grandson, or grandfather or great-grandfather, I'm not sure which, conquered about 80 or 90 years earlier. As long as Karelia is independent and demonstrates it can beat the empire, there is a risk that other parts of that area will revolt. And consequently, it is important that Karelia is defeated. Second question, the emperor has two sons. There is clearly a power struggle going on between the two princes and the emperor. Why hasn't he ended it by simply naming an heir? And the answer is that the second prince, who's the abler of the two, as it becomes clear, is the his mother is a daughter of probably the last local king of the area conquered. That if you think about what happens when the empire conquers someplace, you don't wipe out the upper class. You push them one level down underneath the imperial authorities, but you still use them. So the emperor's the empire is a polygynist society. The emperor has at least two wives that we know of. One of the wives is from the royalty of the conquered area. The other is from the old aristocracy of the empire. The first wife and her son, in effect, bring with them the loyalty of the important people in the new areas. The other wife and her son, the loyalty of the rest of the empire. And the emperor wants to keep both of those in play as long as he can. And that was, I hadn't thought about that. I hadn't seen that my story wasn't really consistent. And all of that came together. And I thought that was really quite neat. So those are some examples of things that I learned from writing the book. Now let me stop and let other people ask questions. Thank you so much. Um, now, when you were writing this, uh, who were the, the most influential uh, authors in the way you approached it? Uh, was it, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you mentioned uh, Vinja and um, uh, Heinlein. Heinlein. I don't uh, think either of them. I would say that insofar as there was an influence on the style of Harald, it was probably the Norse sagas. Uh, because Harald is from a culture that's rather similar to that culture. Uh, one of the problems with Harald is that I deliberately wrote it, uh, especially Harald's dialogue, but also the narration, in a very elliptical style, never using three words where two will do. And I did that because I thought that conveyed some of the feeling that you get in the Norse saga. Now, they're, they're written in Old Norse, which I don't read, so I don't really know how accurate it is, but at least I thought it gave the feel of that society. Uh, and what I did wrong, and I'm still not doing as well as I'd like to, was making everybody else talk like that, too. That what, I, what you ought to be able to do, and I have not yet learned to do, is to distinguish the characters' speech patterns well enough so you don't have to say who's speaking, so that it's clear from what they say. And what I ended up doing was I gave Harold and his relatives, people around him, this style, but I gave something not very different to the imperial soldiers, who I thought of as somewhat similar people in some ways, and I never really distinguished. And I did a little better, I think, in Salamander, but I still, it's still the case that you can't easily tell who is speaking by just looking what they say. And that's a skill I haven't yet, haven't yet learned. So that would probably be the clearest case. Other than that, uh, one of the things that influenced me, oddly enough, uh, there's a early 20th century novelist by the name of John Buchan, B-U-C-H-A-N, whose most famous works are probably Green Mantle and the 39 Steps. And he was writing thrillers around World War I, roughly. He was also, incidentally, for a while, Governor General of Canada. He was quite an interesting character. And there's one of his novels in which the heroes have an opponent who's doing bad things. So they kidnap him and put him through a set of experiences designed to teach him why they are bad things. They're really trying to convert him not to, not to defeat him. And I thought that was a really neat idea. And so that was part of what comes out, uh, especially in Harold and the interaction mainly between Harold and James, that I was trying to do the same thing. And 
to some extent is true of G.K. Chesterton, who's another of my favorite authors, in fact, more of my favorite authors than Buchan is, although I like Buchan, um, that he also tends to have villains who are not really villainous in that sense. Uh, so those are both influences. But I guess the other influence is that, as you probably know, I've been involved for a long time with the Society for Creative Anachronism, a group that does medieval stuff. And one of the things I do in that is storytelling. So I've spent many, many hours around a, uh, sitting by a campfire telling stories from various medieval sources. And some of them are from the sagas. Uh, many of them are from the Islamic literature. Some of them are from other places. Uh, so that was a good deal of what gave me the confidence to try to write a novel was, although there I wasn't inventing the plots, I was inventing the words, I was telling the story, it worked, I, I'm good at it. Uh, and so that had, had a considerable influence. But I don't, I can't think of any authors who I really was, was influenced by in any very strong, strong sense. Certainly not Vinja, and I think not Heinlein either. My next question was going to be uh, why you chose the very distinctive dialogue style uh, for, for Harl and, and his, the people around him. Uh, now, one of the things that I really loved about Harold is that the the environment and everything feels real. It feels like there's a real economy going on. Like it, it's not just a, a painted stage. And I, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that you understand economics. Uh, and you don't see that with a lot of other authors. Is it harder to write things in a realistic way, or if you know? economics and some some theory about you know how political systems work is it just natural i don't know the other person who harold was did, was dedicated to is cj cherry who is a quite able uh, fantasy and science fiction writer and one of the many things i liked about her though not the reason i dedicated the, that book to her is that in one of her fantasies it becomes clear that carts are an important military resource and I don't know if she knows it, but the Magna Carta includes a passage on carts, on the restrictions on the king basically seizing carts to transport military supplies during a war. And that was really quite neat. So there's a part in, in uh, one of her fantasy novels, a uh, pretty good one, where you've got a ruler and his sort of best friend. And the best friend is really the protagonist and is quite an odd and interesting character because he's come back from the dead quite literally. He's... He's roughly the equivalent of somebody reviving Charlemagne or maybe Genghis Khan, depending on your point of view of it, bringing him back to life without much memory, but with his abilities. So it's, it's an interesting book. Uh, but in any case, uh, the question is, will the friend release the carts in time to get them to the ruler so that he can do his military campaign? And it was really neat that she was thinking about that, that, kind, of, that kind of question. So I think some people do. Yeah, a couple of things which I, I, I think also the fact that I do historical recreation helps. So there are a number of touches in there, uh, which probably aren't obvious, but uh, there are a couple of references to making oat cakes. And what that's coming from is a bit in Froissart's Chronicles, where he's describing Scottish troopers who bring oatmeal with them and then bake it uh, for food. And I have, in fact, recreated the recipe. It's a conjectural recreation. We don't have a recipe, but we have what Frossard said about it and made it many times. Uh, my daughter's particularly fond of it, actually. Uh, so that was sort of fun. Uh, and it came across in other ways. For example, there's a point very early on in the sort of introductory part uh, where a lady from the order who is basically fleeing the civil war that's going on, probably her friends have been killed, but you never know for sure, encounters one of the Vales people who's also going across the same pass, who we eventually discover is one of Harold's sons. And she's paranoid. She's quite reasonably paranoid. She's afraid anybody she meets might try to kill her. And the point at which she is convinced this person won't is when he offers her oat cake and salt, because bread and salt is a common ceremony of promising somebody peace and safety. And I refer to sweet taste of oat. Because, in fact, it turns out the notes are sweet. I don't know why they're sweet, but it's a natural characteristic of them. You don't have to add any sugar. So that kind of touch. Uh, another bit, which nobody is going to, almost nobody is going to get, is that there are two different systems for heating houses in that book. That Stephen, 
who is really more nearly an Anglo-Saxon Earl than a Norman Baron. He's a little bit early in sort of cultural style. Has a big hall with a fire pit down the middle and a hole in the roof. And that's the earlier system for home heating. On the other hand, there's a new building in Stevens, a new guest house, which at one point Harold was in in Stevens' building. It has a fireplace. And if you notice, there are fireplaces elsewhere in the story. And it turns out that the invention of the mantel and chimney fireplace was an important technological breakthrough uh, at some point in the Middle Ages. I don't know exactly when, but probably you know, 11, 12, 1300, 1200, maybe. I remember an article on uh, history of technology, which pointed out that the fireplace made it possible to have many rooms instead of one big hall and added that the inventor of the mantel and chimney fireplace did more for courtly love than all the troubadours, which I thought was a neat point. So anyways, I've got various things of that sort. Uh, I have military technology. I've got uh, two kinds of trebuchets, and both of those, of course, are real real weapons. And I, in one place, I cheat, though nobody will ever catch me except because I tell them that there's a point where, for my plot, I needed a large trebuchet to throw a rock a little bit farther than as far as I can tell a real trebuchet could do it. So I did it. And no one but me will know the calculations of how long, I don't say how long the distance is, but you can figure it out if you're, if you're careful by various details of, of what's happening. Uh, anyway, so, so those are all things that went into it. But uh, one of my limitations is that I don't have a visual imagination. So that uh, I don't, e I can't easily see things. I don't have as many physical details as most authors which is a weakness. I try to put them in when it occurs to me. Uh, but on the other hand, I do have details of sort of how the society works, and that's part of what I was trying to do. Well, I think you did a great job at creating a, at least for, for me as someone who is kind of tuned into the economics of things, it seemed like a, a living, breathing society uh, for, from that angle. Now, do you have any advice for... Uh, libertarians who, who want to write, or even just anyone who wants to write uh, fiction? Yeah, it would be anyone, uh, not, not libertarians in particular. I'm not sure that I do. Uh, Harold started out uh, as an insomnia cure. Uh, I was having trouble falling asleep, and I had concluded that daydreaming didn't work, because when you're daydreaming, you're the hero of the story you're imagining, and that gets you too much involved. So I thought if I plotted out a novel, I'd have enough distance from what was happening. So I plotted out pieces of several vaguely similar novels, and then eventually all of one. And the house rules at the time were that when I put either of my kids to bed, I had to tell them three stories. So I would make up and tell three stories. And I mentioned to my daughter that I had this novel in my head, and she suggested that I should uh, tell that to her instead. So I did. And the trouble with telling stories to my daughter was, and probably is if I try it, that she remembers them better than I do. And I'd gotten into trouble in the past when I had a whole series of what I think of, of as extruded fantasy products, sort of generic fantasy stories with the same characters, uh, a brother and sister, of course. Uh, and I would get them into some difficult situation that I would make a story out of. And my daughter would say, but daddy, that magical device they got three months ago, that'll get them out of it with no trouble at all. So this time, every time that I put her to bed, when I finished, I went onto my computer and I outlined the part of the story I had told. And when I got close to the end, I started thinking seriously about writing it. So I wrote the final scene and I liked it. Uh, and then I went back and in a month or two, I wrote all of the first draft of it. And it was enough fun so that I played almost no computer games during that month or two because the writing was more interesting. Uh, so I'm not sure I really have any advice for other people. Different people are different and there's there's a Kipling poem. There, there, there are what is it, six and nine and ninety ways, or six and ninety ways. I'm not sure of, of composing tribal lays, and every single one of them is right. Uh, so I know what worked for me, and in my case, I had the experience of telling a lot of stories, and I had lots of experience as a nonfiction writer. So I knew I could do that, and then it was a matter of sort of getting down and, and writing it. Uh, so no, I, I don't think I can. You know, if you're if, if you don't in some sense enjoy it, it's probably a mistake. But I don't think I have any good lessons of it. I was wondering as I as I read Harold, uh, do you happen to see yourself uh, in any of the characters? Perhaps a, an an older 
wise character, no. very strategic. No. I concluded when I finished Harold, I had modeled Harold on my father as a personality uh, in a variety of ways. No, I'm in, I'm Quailus. That insofar as I'm in it, in Salamander, Quailus, who is the bright, naive, somewhat impractical person, sort of almost the stereotype of the uh, not quite absent-minded professor, but if you think about a lot of the science fiction things, you've got the engineer or something who doesn't, you know, makes doesn't understand people very well. Quailus is that, and I was thinking of him in that sense, in some sense, a parody of my own personality. Ellen is to some extent metal, modeled on both my wife and my daughter. Again, in personality, neither of them is a powerful mosh. Uh, neither of them is even a mathematical genius, although they're both pretty bright. Uh, but, but the personality, really, uh, there's... Ellen's best friend, Mari, uh, at some point is talking to the prince, the, the prince Kieran. It, it's sort of a funny scene because what's happened is that the prince is trying to get a hold of Ellen because she's one of the few people who knows about the, 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 the spell and he wants to make sure all those people are, are not going to talk. And he's perfectly prepared to kill them if he has to, although he'd rather find my other ways of doing it. And Ellen has vanished because she's been warned that he's looking for her, essentially. And he's told that her best friend is a woman called another student called Mari. And so he arranges to have Mari come see him at the inn where he's staying. And Mari walks in the room, drops a low curtsy to her and says, uh, good day, your, your highness. It turns out he's known her since she was eight year old, years old. That she's the daughter of a high ranking nobleman. She, they, they move in the same circles the prince does. Uh, and so you have, and it ends up, I should say, uh, one of the respects in which no plot survives contact with the characters is that Salamander ends up with two love stories, neither of which was planned. And one of them is Ellen and Quailus, and the other is Mari and the Prince. And they are very, very different stories. That Ellen and Quailus are basically intellectuals. It takes a long time for Quailus to realize he's falling in love with his star students, so to speak. It's not clear when Ellen realizes it, but probably a little earlier. Mari and the prince, on the other hand, are sort of fencing all the way to the point when they finally get engaged. Uh, and that was, again, a scene I enjoyed writing. So they are sort of very sophisticated, uh, aristocratic people. Mari is very good at dealing with people. She's no good at dealing with mathematics and things of that sort. When Ellen, at an early point in their friendship, asks Mari how, how she is at mathematics, and Mari says that she can usually add up a column of numbers and get the same answer twice running. Uh, but she's much smarter than Ellen is at, at a different set of things. And when the prince is asking Mari about Ellen, Mari's comment is that she is in some ways an innocent and in others the wisest person I've known. And I thought that was sort of a way of sketching that kind of personality. So, so that was a lot of fun. There's, the way that shows up at one point is that the point at which one of the prince's people gets into trouble, he's trying to grab control of Ellen. Uh, to bring her to the prince. And he does it in an illegal way, in a way using magic that's forbidden. And she gets out of it, uh, escapes it for reasons we won't go into. And later the prince is talking to her and asks her to drop the magical protection that keeps him from seeing what kind of a mage she is and how strong she is. And she does. And his comment was that he is surprised that his servant survived the experience because it's clear that she's a much stronger mage than, than the person who captured her. And her answer is, uh, until I had freed myself from him, I could not kill him. Afterwards, I had no right to. Uh, and that, the fact that it doesn't occur to her to kill somebody because he's, he's, he's acted badly towards her. What she does instead is to, to go to the Ascenti professors, accuse this guy of breaking the rules, and then manipulate things so that he, in effect, demonstrates that he had done so in the process of denying. But that's that's a part of the story. But anyway, so I had a lot of fun with my characters. Uh, but but they they there's an odd sense in which the observation that no plot survives contact with the characters is itself a libertarian observation, because what's going on is that if you try to make the characters do the things you would intend it to happen in the plot, that means forcing them to act in ways those people wouldn't act. And as it were, the libertarian approach within the world you've created in your head is letting those characters do the things those people would do. So it's perfectly clear that once Coelus 
is shown why the spell he's inventing is a very, very dangerous spell, he's not going to keep doing it. He's going to say, all right, I was wrong. What do we do next? Uh, and therefore that changed the plot of, of that book quite a lot from what I originally planned. Uh, other questions from you or from other people? Uh, Reagan asks, what do you enjoy more, uh, writing nonfiction or writing fiction? Oh, boy. Nonfiction's easier. Uh, I'm not sure. I probably enjoy reading my fiction more than I enjoy reading my nonfiction, actually, although I enjoy rereading my work and my work in general. I'm about three quarters of the way through the sequel to Salamander, and I've been stuck for a while, and I may or may not succeed in, in, in finishing it. Uh, probably will eventually. Uh, so it's sort of frustrating in some ways when you don't sort of... Part of the problem, it's a more complicated book than the others, and there are multiple threads going on, and I want them all to matter, so that I want somehow to bring it together at the end. And I also have a problem, which I'm probably never going to get rid of, and that's that I'm a softie that I'm not willing to have really bad things happen to characters I like. And I suspect that a perceptive reader is going to recognize this. And that makes it harder to get up tension. It makes it harder to make it look as though something really terrible is going to happen and then you stop it happening, which is one of the sort of standard devices uh, that fiction authors use. So I, I have some ideas of what I can do about that. Uh, and the other problem, well, one of the complaints that people have made about Salamander, not unreasonably, in fact, about both books, is that my characters have it too easy. Uh, and that may well be true, I'm not sure. Except that in each case, it isn't just the opponents they have to defeat. That is, Harold's problem is not just defeating James, it's defeating James without doing enough damage to the kingdom, the order, and the veils so that the empire will defeat them. And in Salamander, the real problem is not the prince trying to make them do things. It's not even the adjacent polity invading, which happens towards the end. The real policy problem is what to do about the Cascade itself. Because as may or may not be obvious, the Cascade, from one standpoint, the Cascade is the central planning policy. From another standpoint, it's atomic weapons. That is, it's a scientific breakthrough which is potentially very dangerous. And the problem is, what do you do about it? So that's the real problem that Quayles and Ellen are dealing with. You don't know by the end of it whether they're going to succeed in dealing with that problem, uh, that they've partly dealt with it, but only partly. Uh, and consequently, in that sense, it's a harder thing than it seems. Uh, and similarly, there's another character who, for reasons that you only discover partway through the book, is enormously powerful, but he's enormously powerful under circumstances where he has to be very careful not to reveal the fact, and that therefore greatly limits what he can actually do. Uh, so in general, I think I've got people who find who are, who are easy in some ways, but not in all ways. But still, I probably don't make things hard, as hard for my characters as I ought to. Maybe I can do better at that in the future. We'll see. Wesley asks, how do you come up with novel situations to depict in your stories? Hmm, that's interesting. Sometimes it's a particular scene. Uh, that I then work towards. So that, for example, at some point, I think reasonably early on in Harold, I realized in some form the difference between how James looked at the world and how Harold did. And the way I emphasize that is one scene which I had in mind from early on and then worked to get. And that's a scene, the critical thing is that James' first attempt to convert his allies into subjects involves taking prisoner the lady commander of the order, uh, Leonora, pretending that she has resigned and turned over the authority to a kinswoman of his who is in the order. Nobody believes him. That's why it sets up. Some people pretend to believe him, basically. Uh, the order, nobody in the order believes him pretty clearly. And that's what starts off as sort of an undeclared civil war between the kingdom and the order. And one of the things, and James then tries to persuade Harold to support him in this conflict. And very early, in the first introductory passage where Harold's son is talking to a lady of the order who doesn't know who he is, and that lady is worried that Harold and the Vales might support the kingdom against the order, and uh, the Harold's son response is, you'll see the sun rising out of the western plains before Harold makes, makes war upon the order. 
And you don't know exactly why at that point. It's just a strong statement. You eventually discover later on that Harold and Leonora were lovers very early on and that one of the major secondary characters is their daughter, now herself a adult, prominent member of the order. James doesn't know that. It's not a secret, all right? But it happened before he was born. So, and it hasn't occurred to him because he sees the world in organization. It hasn't occurred to him to try to know the biographies of people to make sense of what's going on. Hence, he doesn't realize that getting Harold to ally against Leonora is just hopeless. That, that from Harold's standpoint, it isn't a matter of political allegiance. She's family. And his, his, he, he's now married to somebody else. I mean, this is all a long time ago. But, you know, they've got a daughter in common. They've been close friends and allies for 20-some years fighting these wars and so forth. Uh, and the way I demonstrate that is at the point just after James has finally succeeded in taking, after Harold has finally succeeded in taking James prisoner, uh, James and Harold and Leonora, who at that point is with them, encounter a force that's got Carla, who's Leonora and Harold's daughter, with them. And I maneuver it so that uh, Carla is, I think, in between G uh, Harold and Leonora, her mother and father. And Harold introduces her uh, to the king. This is Lady Carla, our daughter. Before starting feud, Count Kin. And that's the way he looks at it. He looks at it the way an Icelander does. Uh, not in terms of a political structure, but you start a feud with Leonora. I'm, a, I'm, I'm kin to Leonora, in effect. Uh, therefore, you're starting a feud with me. And in fact, a large part of what he's doing in the first part of the book is looking for Leonora, trying to figure out what's happened to her and to rescue her. And eventually, he and Carla succeed in rescuing her before the bit I just, I just described. Uh, so there are lots of stuff of that, of that sort, sort going on. And how much of the people, people follow, I don't know. That part of the reason that, that Harold catches, captures James, which is never made explicit, is because of Anne. That Anne has made it clear to James that, she, that, that he is behaving very badly. He, in some sense, realizes he's behaving very badly, but for various reasons, he sees no way out. So his... The one line which is supposed to hint at what's happening just before he makes the mistake that results in his becoming Harold's prisoner is either way, at least it would be over. So at that point, he doesn't really care whether he lives or dies. Uh, so, so all of that is going on in the background. And as a, people may or may not, but some people pick it up, some won't. The, one of the nice things about publishing stuff on Amazon are the reviews you get. And for Salamander, my favorite review is one where the person says some books you can read without paying attention. This isn't one of them. And he then describes a particular scene where he says, if you understand how it looks to all of the people, you will understand what this particular line means. And he's right. And it's the scene where I w was worried that I was being too subtle. I won't describe it because you'll read it at some point. I want you to get the fun of it yourself. Uh, I was afraid I was being too subtle. And there was at least one reader who clearly had caught what, I was, what was going on. That, that was that was quite neat. Uh, anyway, uh, other questions? Logan asks, if you could turn either of your books into a movie, would you? And if so, which one would you prefer to do? The answer is that the first part of Harold would work as a movie. That novels are too long for movies. That's one of the problems. So that a movie... Generally, if you do a, a novel as one movie, you've got to enormously compress it. Harold, really the first two chunks of it uh, stand by themselves. That they end at the point when Harold has ended the Civil War, brought more or less back to the situation that existed before the earlier king died. Only now with his son, who's not as competent, but who's now learned the lesson, is on his, it realizes he has allies and not subjects. That part of it will work all by itself. You wouldn't have to have the rest of it. And in fact, that's the strongest part of the novel, in my opinion. The reason the rest of it is there is that I wasn't long enough to make a novel, so I decided what, what could happen next, and I then told some more interesting stories. But So I think Harold, I think, would could work as a, as a movie if you just did either book one or book one and book two of it uh, as a movie. 
Salamander, I think, would be much harder to do as a movie. Maybe, maybe it could be, but it, it, you know, it doesn't have much, much action. It doesn't have dramatic scenes very much. Uh, it's in certain senses a more intellectual uh, kind of kind of book. That's that's more about sort of ideas. Uh, so it, I get it would also be hard to do the magic in a sense that you know you can do it in words, but you'd have to figure out what this stuff looked like. One of the things that irritated me about the first Lord of the Rings movie, I didn't see the rest of them, was the con the, the fight between Gandalf and Saruman. Because they did it entirely wrong. And it looked like a Star Wars battle. But we know what Saruman's power is. Saruman's power is his voice. That's the one kind of magic you could do. That the way that scene should have been done was Saruman making this amazingly persuasive argument for why Gandalf should join him. And the watcher saying, as Saruman stopped, obviously Gandalf is going to join him. And then Gandalf pricking the bubble. And then Saruman doing it again and again. That they could have done. But that would you know, be too subtle, I think, for the audience they want. So, so it's not clear to me. Maybe it could be done, but I think, I think it would be hard to do. Uh, also, I think the fact that I do a believable job of... A ver an original version of magic, a version of magic that is a science and is not, as far as I know, the same as anybody else's magic in any previous work of fantasy. I think it would be harder to pull that off in a novel, and that's at least one of the things I like about the book, that I think I make it feel as though. Now, it isn't all there, that I've basically got sort of the first two levels of a science, as it were. I don't have it any deeper than that. So I couldn't really write the equivalent of a physics textbook for the magic. But I can write enough of the beginning of it to make it feel to the reader as if it's there, which is what I'm doing, since a good deal of the plot happens in a college of magic, so you've got lectures and discussions and conversations about magic and so on. Other questions? Uh, I think I'm going to hold out for a Harold video game, or perhaps a, a mod for the, the Melt, Melt and Blade series. I think that would that might work. Um, I, I think... I'll I'll give us the the last question here. Uh, are you ever going to go back to the Harold sequel? I don't know. I wrote maybe ten percent of it. It's got some bits I like a whole lot. Uh, in particular, it 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 starts out with the first prince's son. All right, you've got the empire. It's a good deal of it is in the emperor. Maybe all of it is in the empire. I don't know. But you have the second princes in the western provinces. And his son has been a main second, major secondary character, and he's been a fairly important character in the free in the, in the first in Harold. The older prince is in the capital, the equivalent of Byzantium, as it were, and his son is the character who I start with at least, who uh, at least initially the book is named after. And his son is basically an academic; he's basically an intellectual. He is very loyal. He's very patriotic. He regards not only Harold and his people as barbarians, but his uncle, the second prince, as half barbarian, because after all, his mother is barbarian. He suspects the second prince of various evil things, most of which he hasn't done. He wants to know how he can help. What can he do to serve his side, so to speak, in this internal conflict? Uh, and so what he, one of the things he does is that he finds out that there is a legionary who is a survivor of the defeat of the Imperial Army at the end of Harold, who has gotten back to the capital and is uh, staying at an inn, in effect, dining out on the story, telling the story of the campaign in exchange for the inn, presumably providing a free room and voyage. He doesn't really want to go back to, to, to it. He's got to get back to the army eventually, but he'd like to do it as slowly as possible. And so the emperor's grandson on the older son's side disguises himself as somebody, as someone of not that much importance, and with a friend of his, goes and interviews the guy in order to find out what happened, in order to figure out what's going on, because obviously, you know, the, the, the defeat of the Imperial Army is an important part of the internal politics. He then goes back to the palace and talks to his ex-tutor, who's basically a Greek philosopher type, who is now sort of the house philosopher, because... At this point, Artos is a, is a grown-up. He doesn't need a tutor, but they're still good friends. And they try to figure out what really happened. And they don't assume that everything that they were told by the legionary is true. They realize that he wants to make a good story of it. He may have misunderstood things and so forth. And they, they 
see part of it right, but then they get part of it wrong. They put together a plausible account of what happened that simply is, is, is mistaken uh, because of... But that would be a, be a long... Uh, partly they miss the fact that the legionary has got the order of a couple of the events wrong, just bad memory. And they try to put together a plausible account that preserves that order. And to do that, it has to depend on treachery by the second prince, which Ardos is perfectly willing to believe in. So that's one of the things that's happening. One of the other things that's happening in that book, and that is more or less written, is the, is the tug of war, in fact, the game of chicken, between the emperor and the second prince. Because the emperor wants the second prince to be his heir, because the second prince is clearly the more competent of the two. The emperor wants the second prince to commit to continuing the war with Kerlia. That's made clear at the very end of Harald, uh, where the emperor doesn't realize that Harald also has two generations ready to go once he dies. Uh, the, but the emperor's view basically is, yes, you've beaten me. It's our bad luck that you're a brilliant general, but you're an old man. I'm an old man too, but I have a son. And eventually, his view is really the empire lasts and has long-term plans that the barbarians don't have kind of thing. And he wants to insist as the price of his supporting the second prince for the succession to the second prince publicly committing to continue the war. Second prince doesn't want to commit, continue to commit the war. He believes that they're making a mistake, that they should make peace with Carolee and go invade someone else, basically. Uh, and so... The emperor is an old man. It's not clear how long he's going to live. So in effect, they're playing a game of chicken where if the emperor dies before declaring an heir, there might be a civil war or the first prince might get it. And the emperor is threatening, in effect, to do that if the, if the second prince won't come around what he wants. And what finally changes that is the conversation between the emperor and the second prince's son. Because the second prince's son, having spent a month or so as a guest at Harald Holt, realizes what the emperor does not realize, that Harald has got two generations of successors ready. That Karla is going to replace her mother, indeed replaced her mother in a sense in the last campaign. And that Osbjorn, who's Harald's grandson, is basically Harald age 15. Uh, and you can see that in his, in his personality and characteristic. And therefore, whereas the emperor has been relying on the fact that once Harald is done, it's going to be James in charge, and James isn't competent to, to, to win the war. That's pretty clear, even though he's, he's more competent than he was at the beginning of the story, but he's still... Uh, and the emperor's grandson persuades him that he's wrong. And then one of my favorite scenes is the scene where the emperor calls all of the important in, people in for a feast, annou announces that the second princess is there, swears everybody in sight to uh, accept him and is having a heart attack while he's doing it. And his grandson is sitting next to him. And at the very end, when he's finally done it, the, his line to himself is, the body is servant, not master. And he turns to his grandson and he says, comes your turn, boy, don't disappoint me, and dies into his arms. So he's the villain, I like him. You know, he's a he's a tough-minded guy who's doing what he sees as his duty. Uh, so that scene I like. So I may someday write the rest of that story. I don't know. But at the moment, I'm I'm involved in, Sal in, in the sequel to Salamander, which I'm currently calling Eric, but they eventually call Brothers. And which, again, sort of with regard to my not having villains, the initial central figure in that book is the son of the villain of Salamander. And as Mari comments at one point, a much nicer person than his father. Uh, and, and I've got an idea for a third book in the Salamander sequence. And if I write that one, it's going to be sort of odd, because the current idea, at least, is that it starts long before Salamander and ends after Eric. So it's sort of, uh, Eric is a sequel to Salamander, and this is a sequel in terms of when I would write it. But it would show various things that we haven't seen, but they're sort of in the background of the other books and then bring you the conclusion. Its, it's, it's tentative title is The Long War. Hmm. And it's, well, a war certainly... you, it's a war you don't even yeah. know is going on in Salamander, although it becomes clearer in, in Eric. I, I'm certainly looking forward to reading Salamander. I, I greatly enjoyed Harald. 
And uh, I'll, I'll be looking forward to reading uh, Eric and hopefully the long war and hopefully the, uh, the sequel to Harald. So I, I definitely encourage everyone here to, to go read Harald and Salamander. Uh, I can personally vouch for Harald. I know it sounded like there may have been a lot of spoilers here, but there's definitely a lot that's worth investigating for yourself. So everyone go check that out. I'll actually uh, link to to that in chat in just a minute here when we finish and, and up. If you, if you do read it, post reviews to tell me what, what's right, what's wrong, what worked, what didn't work. Because part of the, I mean, I don't really write as a way of making a living, but I do want to get feedback. Excellent. Uh, well, I, I want to let people know what's going on here at Liberty Me Live this week. Uh, tomorrow night we've got uh, Professor Dan D'Amico and uh, SFL campus coordinator Nathan Goodman on for SFL On Air with their host Zoe Little. Uh, Thursday night we've got uh, two sessions. We've got uh, our resident uh, fiction author uh, Frank Markopoulos, who I think he was uh, in this session a bit earlier. He makes it to almost all of our sessions. He's going to be, uh, it's a book, book release and drinking game for the release of his new collection of short stories, Infinite Ending. And it's, it's a postmodern set of short story, stories with libertarian themes. And uh, that should be really interesting, and the drinking game should be fun. We've also got the continuation of Zack Slayback series on moral psychology Thursday night, right after Frank's class. Uh, Friday night, we've got a... Uh, Zach Goschenauer uh, is going to be talking about the legacy of Gordon Tullock, who, of course, uh, unfortunately died last month. He'll be talking about public choice and, uh, and and Gordon Tullock's legacy, and I think that's going to be a great talk. Saturday night, we've got uh, Kat Bleich is going to be talking about Bitcoin-only travel. So she's just taken her second uh, tour of part of the country uh, with using only Bitcoin. So... That should be interesting. She's got a great perspective on that. So hope to see you back here this week at Liberty Me Live. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. And I appreciate you all being here. Take care.